This is the design of the Arate supercar. This is what it looks like today, but we're getting ahead of the story. Hello, I'm Jay Jarvey, and today is the day. We're going to take a look at what it takes to build a car from the ground up. But to do that, we need the big picture, so we're going to go way back to the beginning. No, we need to go way back. This is me at age 16, sitting in my first car. It was still a work in progress. I had no idea what I was doing. I had no guidance. I had no internet or YouTube to show me how to do things. I hardly had any money, but I had a dream. Now let's skip forward. With a few more years of ad experience, or should I say a few decades, a half dozen or more car builds under my belt, a few thousand other projects, and a little wisdom with age, well, here I am again with a new vision, new inspiration, and a new budget. And born from all this is the Arate Supercar Project. So let's get to work. Good engineering is all about materials, materials and problem solving. There are many methods of creating a large object like a car, but in this project, I've chosen to build it in composites. Composites mostly created from S-Glass fiberglass, and to form our fiberglass, we need a full-size model, or a plug, it's often called, to pull molds from. Now these molds will help us create the shell and structure of the car. Over the years, I've perfected a method of forming this full-size plug from rib templates and a plaster of Paris. Another more modern method may be to use a CNC machine to carve a body plug from foam. I found, however, that working in plaster is similar to clay like the big car manufacturers and the design houses use. And this allows me to add and subtract material and test new styling features while still being creative on the fly. Whereas CNC machining is a more final and committed process. All in all, our plaster plug helps us create eight molds for the basic shell of the car. Much of the interior and the structural components of the car were hand formed and laminated in place as part of the composite monocoque. Monocoque meaning the chassis and body are one integral component. If we'd created all these parts with the compound return edges, such as door jams, seal plates, turn back edges, and double surfaces, the number of molds would have been in the dozens, and definitely would have required a team of engineers to model and test. But there ain't no team, and there ain't no time for that kind of thing in this project. It's just little old me who's got to get it all done. Which brings me to another point. Not only is good engineering about materials and problem solving, Good engineering is about staying in a budget. That plaster and burlap we mentioned before, that is budget friendly. Massive foam blocks and CNC time is not. Now I'm not opposed to modern computer aided manufacturing, but you can manage without it. When you're going to use modern CNC, you're after precision and repeatability, both of which call for more money. And this is a one-off prototype and a not so precise prototype at that, more of a proof of concept prototype. In composite structures, you can design in a way that things like suspension and drive can components can attach directly to the matrix, fiberglass in our case. However, these high stress areas require special embedments to carry the loads and high degree of engineering to transfer those loads throughout the monocoque. I chose to reduce the amount of complex attachments by the use of steel tube or chromoly subframes front and back. These subframes carry the suspension and the drive chain attachment points. Additionally, although the whole project is generally planned out and documented in a CAD drawing, I'm often creating components that don't rely on any particular progress prerequisite or an assembly line. The subframes act as subsystems that get built separately and then all come together as the build develops. Now, some people have been critical of seeing the body and the styling done first and the mechanical second saying, oh you should have finished the completed chassis before that fancy body work. But again, it is just little old me doing all this work. No matter what order my work appears in YouTube, it is no different than the big car manufacturers having a dashboard built 50 states away months before the pistons get forged. We will just say that I jump around sometimes and work on what I want to work on. Also, everyone has their opinion about power plants. In my case, I chose to go with the Toyota 1JZ inline six engine. This is a robust platform that benefits from the inherent natural balance of the straight six arrangement. This engine is also popular in the tuning and aftermarket world and finds its way into many racing drag racing and drift car applications. Or in other words, for a lower displacement engine, it is one of the better architectures for the price. The 1JZ is the little brother of the 2JZ engine, but uses a shorter piston stroke and thus a little slightly higher rev limit. I'm hoping to extract 600 horsepower from the engine. 
To do this, I've added twin turbos with an intercooler, larger injectors and a larger throttle body, a fully tunable electronic control unit, and a custom exhaust. Now I've mentioned budget and price. I set a budget originally of $25,000 for this project. That may increase a little bit and I'll probably be closer to $35,000 by the time this project is finished. Now even while spending what may be equal to the price of a brand new car, there are some limitations. Well, maybe not so much limitations or just the budget makes you forced into making some certain considerations. Let me give you a couple of good examples. The windshield is from a 90s era Chevy Cavalier. I could afford the $120 for that windshield. I could not afford the ten dollars to $20,000 to have a custom windshield made. The trade-off is that I had to work my design around that windshield rather than have complete freedom in my design. The same consideration had to be made for the drivetrain. And most longitudinal mounted mid-engine cars would use a transaxle setup. Even when you source a used transmission from a Porsche, one that can't handle the 600 horsepower, you might be talking nine dollars to $12,000 on the low side. This would have been half my budget. The solution was go to with a less expensive mass-produced transmission and use it in a way that is rather unconventional. You see, I've turned the engine around backwards, placed the transmission forward between the seats, and made the car all-wheel drive. This may sound like it would actually be more expensive, but when the transmission only costs you $350, you can see that the budget is still open for all kinds of auxiliary components to connect the wheels to the power. Sometimes the idea of doing things the difficult way has also driven the design of the car. Often I'll make the smaller parts rather than buy them. This has helped the budget and opened up some design freedom as well. I tell myself I want to build most of the components purely for the learning experience, even if it is the more difficult way. The bonus here is that I've been able to complete freedom in the design instead of the suspension. Well, I say complete freedom, but there's that nasty problem on the budget I mentioned before. At any rate, I'm building all the wheel hubs, or uprights, as some call them, all the control arms, the anti-sway system, and many other components, all from scratch. The final item on the list of budget-saving features is carbon fiber. Or should I say the lack of it? Right off, I knew I would not be using this material because of its price and the price associated with it. Again, the internet's full of people who insist that I should have done things differently, and carbon fiber tops that list. Of course, it's easy to suggest that someone else should pony up and add an extra $17,000 to their project, but I could not afford to use it on this car. I mentioned before that I'm using a special fiberglass called S-Glass fiberglass, which has a much higher strength than the run-of-the-mill sprayed-on chop strand fiberglass typically associated with boats and kit cars. With this S-Glass, I can achieve an 80% price savings over carbon fiber with only a minor weight penalty. Well, the weight penalty is acceptable, as the extra $17,000. By carefully orienting the fibers in the optimal direction and using only enough layers to achieve the strength we need, we'll have a strong and lightweight car. Just not quite as light as carbon fiber design. But never fear, carbon fiber looks great when it's left exposed and unpainted, so we'll be using some carbon fiber in the trim and cosmetic parts like the seats, the dashboard trim, the intake ducts, plus a bunch of other parts that are coming in the future. Sometimes the strength does not need to come from some exotic material anyway. Sometimes you don't want a stiff material. Take this craft structure I'm building from aluminum. Aluminum strength in this example is that it is malleable or can be deformed and stay together. This structure is designed to bend and fold as energy absorbed in a crash. If the crash is severe, the whole subframes are designed to break away from the tub or the occupant cell and not be a part of the inertia dragging those occupants along. Now you've heard some of the reasons I have built the car the way I have and the steps involved and the cost. But what about the other cost? Time. In this short video, I've had to skip over hundreds of hours of video showing thousands of hours of work for all the little things like fabricating the molds, laminations, engine rebuilding, welding suspension components, the exhaust system, building the wiring harness, building the ECU, and fabricating the steering column mounts. But there is that and still a lot more to do. Now, I've been posting videos on this channel for about the last four years. And as they say in the home-built car world, we're about 75% done with only 80% to go. Now, I would be done with this car if I was able to devote all my spare time to it, but I do have other business and family matters to attend to on occasion. Then there is the fact of turning all this work into videos. It takes a long time, but that is time well spent because I love the idea of being able to connect with like-minded people here on YouTube. So if you are interested in this kind of thing, make sure you subscribe to the channel, 
ring the little icon bell too so that YouTube will notify you when new videos become available. Now, if you're new here and just discovered this channel and you're interested in seeing the 80 plus other videos in this Airte Supercar project, I will put a link right up over here that you can jump over at the beginning and see those videos. Or if you are into off-roading and crazy overlining motorhomes, I happen to be building one of those as well. I will put a link up over here. You can go over and see that project as well. And now we know, yes, you can build a car from scratch. Anyway, thanks for stopping by. Come back, see us again.